I really want to thank Mona for being here today after a marathon uh, weekend. Uh, she organized a three-day event in downtown Cairo, a wonderful conference that was very, very well attended uh, at Rawabi Theatre downtown. And the title of the conference was The Only Thing Worth Globalizing is Dissent, Translation, and the Many Languages of Resistance. And Mona has just told me that uh, the talks will have been videotaped and will be up on the keynotes, the, the keynotes mm. on the uh, website uh, for the conference, so we all look forward uh, to that. Uh, very briefly, let me introduce uh, Professor Baker. Mona Baker is Professor of Translation Studies at the Centre for Translation and Intercultural Studies, University of Manchester in the UK, and is currently leading the Citizen Media at Manchester Initiative. Um, she is author of In Other Words, a course book on translation. Uh, published in 1992, again in 2011, and is actually a classic in the field of translation studies. Um, uh, other works include Translation Conflict, a narrative account, uh, Routledge 2006, and she is the editor of the Routledge um, Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, uh, among many other works. I don't want to take uh, uh, much of her time since we have a short uh, session. So, uh, without further ado, uh, please help me welcome Mona Baker. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you to Ferial as well for the invitation. Uh, first time in campus here. And I have to warn you that I'm a little bit on autopilot because they, that marathon event, it wasn't just the three days, but all the stuff leading up to the three days and the uncertainty of being able to hold a conference called The Only Thing Worth Globalizing is Dissent and has resistance in the title and people like Khaled Abdullah and so on um, speaking. So it's been a very tense period, but it's also kind of a period that's clarified uh, a number of, um, of things in my mind. Um, for those who are interested, you can have um, one of the posters for the conference, or uh, I don't have enough, but also there's a book coming out, not of the conference, it preceded the conference called Translating Dissent, and it does have um, many of the papers that are uh, were presented at the conference, but others also that were not presented. Um, but the, the, the kind of, the, the conference and the lead up to the conference um, was all part of a large, uh, large-ish uh, research project, a fellowship that was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, um, and it's called something like Translating the Egyptian Revolution, uh, a bit like uh, Samia's wonderful uh, book, Translating Revolution. Uh, and the idea was behind it was to um, find ways of looking at what has been happening on the translation side within the Egyptian Revolution to highlight the political import of translation because, unfortunately, most people, including very, very uh, clever academics who come from other disciplines, tend to have a blind spot when it comes to translation and to assume that translation is kind of benign and it's uh, technical stuff, boring stuff, and it's just a question of finding the right word, the right equivalent, and that's all there is to it, and they don't necessarily reflect on the political import of that. As I was saying in the closing of the conference uh, last night, um, that kind of very reductive conceptualization of translation was something I was uh, grateful for for the first time in my life because it's precisely that reductive understanding of translation that has allowed us to go through with this conference, which, which had to go through Amnit Dawla, state security, and, all the, and, and we played out the translation element and downplayed the dissent element. And if you look at the Arabic trans, uh, translation of the subtitle, of course we dropped the... Uh, globalizing dissent completely, that doesn't feature in Arabic, but the Arabic translation of translation and the many languages of resistance that everybody kept commenting on is a tergama wal lughat al muta'addida lit ta'bir, which is, and people kept saying, people kept saying, a conference on translation and you don't know how to translate the title, and so I had to explain that this is, this is, um, you know, something to do with, with the context in which the political landscape in which uh, the conference is taking place, and it actually worked very well in terms of um, amplifying the overall message of the conference and the research project, which is that 
translation is part of the political landscape and it has a political import. It's not about translating words with their equivalences. equivalences. So this is the kind of the, 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 the background. The project itself is about looking at the use of translation, specifically volunteer subtitling in the Egyptian Revolution. And it builds on earlier work that I did on, which I presented actually uh, downtown, on uh, translation in global activism. Uh, this time I'm focusing on place-based movements and specifically the Egyptian Revolution. So um, I'm going to, you know, in the time that's available very quickly, just run you through some of the main issues. And I want to start with the issue of context again, because again, people who uh, write and talk about translation tend to ignore the context in which it's happening in the same way that everybody said, you know, what's wrong with your Arabic? You don't, and, and it didn't occur to them that there is more to it than that. Uh, in this context, earlier when I was looking at translation in global activism, um, I was looking at groups of translators who form, who form groups of translators as such and who want to help and uh, get involved in things like the World Social Forum and other venues. Uh, and these people were doing excellent work. They were doing lots of very creative work where translation itself became an alternative political space in which you can exercise agency. But they were not being shot at in the street. They were not risking uh, detention and arrest. They are working at the global level, kind of a bit removed from the kind of context that I found when I was looking at the use of subtitling here. And I, to give you an idea of what this context is, and uh, in, in order to temper your ideas about some of the examples I will show, uh, I'm going to quote from Samah Selim, who you will be familiar with, who is a great scholar, but she's also a great activist, and she was out on the streets all the time uh, during much of the revolution, and she was also uh, translating, subtitling for uh, the Musarin Collective. And she describes that experience in terms that I think we should bear in mind. She says, in the heat of the battles, many of which lasted for days, new videos would be uploaded to YouTube by the Musarin filmmakers, and sent on via email link to the translator's network for immediate subtitling, sometimes as many as five or six a day. I would often find myself rushing back from the fighting and tear gas to whichever friend's apartment I would be squatting in at the time to do a speedy subtitling job on a video document of the battle I had just left at the doorstep with panicked people coming and going in a steady buzz of TV, laptops, cell phones, and frantic discussions all around. The emergency was out on the streets but it was also a central part of the translation process. So any kind of comment I might have now about uh, choices that were taken in the subtitling that had certain political implications, some of them desirable, some of them undesirable, have to be understood not as a corrective uh, to saying they could have done it better because you cannot, you know, you, you can't, uh, in this kind of context, you cannot, you haven't got the luxury to experiment and to think of better ways of doing things. So it's not meant as a corrective. It's meant to give us some insight into the political implications of choices uh, in this kind of context, whether those implications were intended, people subtitled in that way because they wanted to achieve that effect, or unintended, but still they have a certain effect. So it's not a corrective in any way. So when I started the project, I had to really decide on a way in, you know, so, so okay, you're going to study people like Mussolini and words of women from the Egyptian Re revolution and look at the subtitling. What are you going to look for? What are you trying to, to see? And my way in was uh, not to look at uh, things that could have done be been done better or, or, or errors, but to look at the way in which uh, the subtitling contributes or does not contribute to the political project, whether it amplifies the message of the political project or whether it un undercuts the political project without thinking that they could have done it better because obviously, you know, this is a very, very strict situation. And so, for example, when you look at this type of thing, this is from uh, Mussolini, for me, this is totally irrelevant to what I'm trying to do, although it's very obvious that you have problems. If we had wanted to get to the ministry, we would have easily did it, okay? Somebody who's fixated on the idea of translation as, you know, equivalence and per perfection and all would freak out, you know, say, this is horrible. Um, or this, he heard about Khalil Said, obviously it's meant heard. 
these things, not only are they not relevant in the sense that this is, you know, beside the point, in fact, in a kind of strange way, they support the political project in the same way that when you see footage from uh, the Battle of Muhammad Mahmoud or something, and it's, it's a very grainy image because it's been taken on a mobile, that adds to its authenticity. Hmm? Whereas if you've seen something coming out that's very professional and high resolution and so on, you'd think, <laughs> you know, this is a, something is, 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 is not quite authentic there. So that kind of, if you like, error, which is easy to process and which can be understood in the context of a crisis situation, is not, uh, not only is it not relevant, but actually it's, I wouldn't bother with correcting it because the idea is not to present the projects as, as professional as such. So um, just before I say a couple of things about the choices, these are a kind of sources. One should be clear about their sources, usually. Um, I conducted 14 semi-structured interviews, uh, which lasted anything from 35, four minutes to over two hours with people like uh, the filmmakers themselves, like um, for, uh, from Mussolini and Words of Women from the Egyptian Revolution, people like Khaled Abdullah, Philip Riz, uh, uh, Omar Robert Hamilton, but also the, and Leil Zahra Murtada, but also the subtitles. So Samah, for instance, in her capacity as a subtitler, not in her capacity as a translation scholar. Katya over here, who coordinated the uh, mailing list for Mussolini, uh, Marwa, uh, various people, Ethel, who did most of the Spanish, uh, the translation into Spanish of words of women from the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, there is also, of course, the output itself, which is all the videos that are available on um, on the uh, Internet and Mussolini output in particular is he is prolific, it's extremely prolific. With words of women from the Egyptian Revolution, you only have 11 episodes. You can look at them all, but uh, Mussolini is it's a huge amount of uh, stuff. Uh, people like Philip Riz uh, and to some extent Khalid Omar do give interviews, and so and these interviews are published and you can draw on them. There is a fair bit of media coverage, particularly of Mussolini. Um, which uh, again provides some insight into what the filmmakers were trying to do in their own culture and their own idea of the political project. Um, Katya and colleagues uh, on the Mussolini mailing list kindly allowed me in to the mailing list. Uh, they knew what I was doing and the research, but they allowed me to join the mailing list and kind of listen in to some extent. And I've been involved to some extent with very little uh, subtitling to get a feel for what is going on. And then there's all the social media, the Mussolini accounts, words, words of women from the Egyptian Revolution stuff on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on blogs. And I got unexpectedly uh, a lot of insights through this project, which is the collected volume which preceded the, the, the conference, um, which was one of the, if you like, horrible corporate uh, terminology, but one of the outputs of the research project, as they call it. Uh, when people like Samah started writing, when people like Khaled Abdullah started writing, and I, I read what they wrote, that also gave me a lot of insight into what they're doing. So these are kinds of my sources, and of course in this short period I can only give you a little bit of a, a glimpse of a much larger thing that's going on. Um, so I'm going to start with... Um, I'm only going to choose two political principles, two political values that inform these projects and also inform global activism today and see how they relate to uh, the, the subtitling and what the subtitling did. So the first principle I want to look at or value that really orients all global activism now and that Mussolini and Words of Women and everybody I've talked to uh, in these groups uh, partake of is the principle of solidarity. And by solidarity, I don't mean charity. It's not about you know getting people to be nice to us and sign a petition or whatever. Solidarity builds on the idea that uh, people now realize that the system of oppression is in some ways the same everywhere. It transcends the local space that you're struggling in. Uh, because you know, as Philip Riz puts it in, in an interview I did with him for translating the scent, the tear gas canisters that are used against us come from the states, and so the struggle in Auckland is also our struggle. But at the same time, our struggle here is specific, and it's dealing with also lo local things. So solidarity means understanding that the system of oppression is connected, and therefore you have to struggle together, but also doing what is specific to your struggle. 
So these connections are very important, not because we want charity, but because we want solidarity. We want to, to, to struggle in ways that connect and allow us to uh, change things. So in terms of what are the implications of that for subtitling, first of all, when you think about it, and it's totally expected and probably couldn't have been otherwise in the context, the first language and sometimes the only language into which all videos are subtitled is English. And in some respects, you could say this is a very fortuitous um, uh, choice because if you want the people in the states to stop their, their governments sending us tear gas canisters and, and, and bullets, then they have to understand our struggle. Um, and then secondly, the, that, that's one argument, of course there are other arguments. Uh, second, probably biggest choice would be probably Fra uh, Spanish and then going into French, German, and then sometimes there are some videos that are uh, subtitled to Turkish, Greek, Italian. Um, but uh, uh, you don't go into it like Swahili or Gyoko or uh, Tamazakh, for instance, although these people have struggles and they, you can argue that this is where the system of oppression is at its most brutal and solidarity is needed but there isn't the time, the resources, but also the idea is maybe we reflect for next time around. An effort wasn't made to reach these communities. So solidarity is limited by the choices that are made in terms of the subtitling language. And Katya over here says, said in the interview I did with her, um, I don't know if anybody anywhere in Africa has, has ever heard of Mosserine or the Egyptian Revolution, which of course is a, is a good point, because people in Africa don't always necessarily speak English, but also even if they spoke English, perhaps not to the high standard that allows them to understand the nuances of a very complex political situation that is being subtitled into, into English. More problematically, you could think of, is the fact that most of these uh, subtitles are done via English. So you first translate into English, and then from English into Spanish, from English into Turkish, and so on. And um, Lail reflects on this in the uh, article he's, he wrote, the essay he wrote for the volume. He says, not only did we prioritize subtitling into English, but we also used it as an intermediate language on which to base other sets of subtitles. In other words, given our own linguistic limitations and the pressure we were working under, we decided rightly or wrongly to put our reservations aside and invite volunteers to subtitle from English into their own languages, the compa thus compounding the problems associated with relying on an imperial language to communicate what is essentially an anti-imperial message. So allowing English to, use, to be used as a filter for the values that were being expressed in Arabic and the situations that, so it's, it, that itself um, is problematic. When Leil was asked this question at the conference, unfortunately he was the only one he w who was denied a visa and could not come, but we connected to him via Skype and we had a lovely conversation with him. Uh, when he was asked that question uh, by somebody else at the conference, he said, look, there are lots of languages that are imperial. It's not as if Spanish is not a colonial language. It's not as if Arabic itself is not a colonial language now in places where, for example, the Berber are living. So all languages, or a lot of the languages, are imperial, imperial to one extent or another, but of course it's still a problematic that could be reflected on, and I, I don't know what can be done. I'm not saying this because I think they could have done it differently, uh, or should have done it differently. Uh, I'm saying because we have to be aware of these political implications of the, choice, of the choices that are made. So this is at the level of kind of a higher level of, um, of choices of what language and whether you translate directly or indirectly. Uh, the second principle I want to talk about is the principle of diversity, which is extremely important in all global movements. In fact, the founding document of the World Social Forum says very clearly that this, was, this is a basic principle in global activism uh, now, and they say very clearly our, our um, unity relies in our diversity. It comes from our, our diversity, so uh, you have to account for the entire spectrum of people in the world and not just for an elite, for example, uh, or a particular type of person with a particular type of social background. This is very, uh, very uh, clearly reflected in the words of women uh, from the Egyptian Revolution, choice of women to interview to talk about the role of women in the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, if you look at the 11 episodes, you have Muslims, you have Christians, you have a very devout uh, Muslim woman wearing an aqab, you have uh, veiled women, you have 
uh, women who are uncovered. Uh, you have young people, starting women starting from 18 years old to older women from 52. You have women who very clearly come from a particularly high social class and speak English and their language is infused with lots of English and ones who are not like that at all, like Ali over here, you know. So that diversity is built into the project itself. Similarly, if you look at the uh, huge output of Mussolini, you will, say, you will see that the voices on, uh, on these videos are really multiple and diverse. You have people, you know, from all kinds of social walks of life. Uh, you have men, women, uh, young, old, all kinds of things. So th this principle is enacted in the original project. Some of the choices in the subtitling undercut this project. Again, I'm not saying, you know, they had the time to think uh, otherwise, but um, let me just show you a couple of examples. So, in um, Why Riot, which is a, uh, one of the Mussolini uh, videos, which talks about, you know, why violence, why riot on the street, you have this woman, you can see very clearly what you know, what she looks like and the expressions on her uh, face and she's obviously from a particular social background, she's not well educated and she says literally in Arabic and I was struck by the choices in the subtitling where you have, it was provocateurs, which is a very high register word, uh, hiding amongst the revolutionaries and using the constitution as a fig leaf. Again, it's fairly high register. And what these choices do, which again, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, this is ha happening at, in a crisis situation at great speed, but what these choices do is cumulatively is they homogenize the, the, the diversity of the voices in the original project and uh, they undercut a very important principle of the political pro project which is diversity by making a lot of these people sound the same and sound like a perfect elite they're also playing into the common and very widespread narrative uh, that's circulating in many parts of the West that the revolution was carried out by elite young people on Twitter and Facebook who all obviously belong to a particular social class. So these are the kinds of things that you need to think about uh, in terms of you know, how the subtitling works, functions within the entire project. Uh, similarly, uh, the issue of code switching, you all know what code switching is, switching between languages, all varieties of, of language. And you have, for example, in words of women, uh, this particular uh, woman and her uh, daughter who are interviewed alongside each other, uh, they both code switch a lot. They use a lot of English, and so here, uh, what she says in Arabic uh, includes a sort of sort of a joke is actually said in English. Okay. Now, if you're subtitling into English, of course, it's difficult to highlight this. I, when I asked Lail why he didn't, for example, use italics, just to because people are viewing at great speed and they may not pick everything up easily, he said, to be honest, I didn't think about it at the time. But even if I had thought about it, because they were working at speed, even if I had thought about it, uh, YouTube at the time did not allow the use of italics. So that's a technological constraint. However, you look at the Spanish subtitles, and that also disappears. That feature of the language of that woman and several other women uh, disappears. So it could have easily uh, been kept in, in English, because you could argue also that even the Arabic the Arab viewer listening, if they don't know English, they will still have the same difficulty with a sort of, sort of a joke. Yeah? So um, these things, as I, as I mentioned, basically um, undercut the political project in terms of solidarity and, um, and uh, what was it I said? Uh, sorry, I'm not quite. And diversity. Uh, however, at the same time, the space of subtitling can and was used as a space of prefiguration in the sense, I haven't got time to explain what, in detail what prefiguration is, but it's a, a very important principle of contemporary movements, and it's what distinguishes 
the political logic of contemporary mo movements from the political logic of things like Marxism and so on. Uh, prefiguration means that you, uh, these movements believe that you can't say, I'm going to wait until the revolution succeeds and then I'm going to uh, apply these principles. They do not separate the means and the ends. Uh, you, you try to create in the here and now the world that you are trying to bring into being. So you don't put it on hold while the revolution you know, takes place and, and wins and then you start applying the principles. And so you find ways of making these principles work in the here and now. And um, one way in which this uh, is very evident in Words of Women because the subtitles into Spanish were supervised by Lil Zahra who is the founder of, of the project and who is very, very sensitive to issues of gender and of sexuality, was that he decided uh, uh, for that space to uh, make sure that uh, all the markings of gender in Spanish, which works very much like Arabic, uh, Spanish is just like Arabic, everything has to be marked for, ge for gender, you know, plural nouns, singular nouns, adjectives, everything, even articles. Uh, he decided to resist that um, tendency to use the plural masculine or the singular masculine to mean someone. So a friend, for example, in English, uh, would be in Spanish, you'd have to, and in Arabic, you'd have to choose between masculine and feminine. And normally we just use the masculine to mean any friend. He decided to resist that and to use the space of subtitles, even though it's not a feature of the speech of the women he was interviewing, to use this, the space of subtitling to resist that and to prefigure a different kind of uh, relationship between uh, men, women, and the wider society. So what you have here is an example of what he did. Can you see it? I don't have Spanish, but I can see exactly what's. So this would be una amiga or uno amigo, right? Una amiga. Una is it? Right. Now, Spanish uh, activists have long been using a particular um, way of uh, marking gender that is uh, that is non-sexist, which is to use the, you know, the at for the email that you have in your email address. address. So most, usually, they instead of this X, they would use the at, okay? Uh, again, when I asked uh, Lil why he didn't use this, if he reflects on it in the, in the essay, he says, well, because you could read at as a or O as a combination of the two, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted to, to blow the whole gender thing apart. I wanted to say, I am not going to be boxed into either uh, female or male. Yeah? So what, 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 what happens here, as you can see in other examples, is that the space of subtitling, whether you agree with it or not, it's the principle there, the space of subtitling is itself used as part of the political project creatively in order to further um, uh, a principle and a basic value that informs the project in ways that are creative and that could have been extended and would have been exp extended if the time allowed, I suppose, into other areas. Uh, it was more difficult to do, I imagine, this in Musarim because the Musarim videos were really, were really documented kind of and done under huge, in huge crisis situations. Uh, Lail's videos were a little bit r slightly more re removed from, from that situation. So, um, yeah, last slide. What disappointed me in all this is that when I actually, I thought, ah, oh, I found something creative, and very reflective in translation. When I spoke to the subtitlers, I realized that it wasn't their idea at all. It was the idea of the filmmaker and that they didn't feel it was their place to suggest creative things, to intervene to tell the filmmakers we could do this. There was no dialogue between the two, essentially. Uh, so, so the political project is, is fragmented in that on the one side you have the filmmakers, on the other side you have the subtitlers. It's the filmmakers who uh, make the decisions and, and uh, suggest uh, and tell the subtitlers what to do in this instance, or don't bother to tell them. You know, uh, um, the Muslim filmmakers don't tell the subtitlers to do, as far as I know, right? But yeah, they don't tell them what to do. They just leave them to it. Uh, and I think for future reference, and if we have time for reflection, assuming there will be other projects like this, that we can perhaps start taking these things into account. And I think, I hope that the subtitles can play a much more uh, prominent and proactive uh, role in this kind of work, in the same way that the translators working at the global level 
actually really do intervene and they think of themselves as political actors in their own right, as part of the political project, and they extend the political project into the translation work, they don't see the translation as an appendix to the, uh, to the political project, they see it very much as part of the political project to the extent that a group like Babels who interpret volunteer do interpreting volunteer interpreting for the World Social Forum have had from day one uh, a long extended arguments with the organizers of the World Social Forum to tell them we are not service providers, we are not caterers, we are part of the forum, we are political actors and we will act politically as translators in the way that we see fit. So I think that somehow this logic maybe could be taken into not just the Egyptian, well, the Egyptian revolution, but, but generally into place-based movements where people are working under crisis and they're working locally with small groups rather than big structures like, uh, like the World Social Forum. I'll stop to allow time for questions and, or comments or challenges. Okay. You can see I'm in auto mode. I've been clapping at the conference. Applauding you. Thank you for a wonderful talk, actually. Thank you. 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 Thank
I don't know. I mean, other people can can what comment. What is the relevance of he's transgender or he's not transgender? I mean, this is, doesn't interest me. It interests me the revolution. You know, it interests me what he does. What is his identity, sexual identity? It's not important for me. At I mean, I don't think it's an issue. Perhaps some of course it's an issue for some people. You know, but the context you know, should not bring it up. What do you think? Uh, oh, I thought you wanted to uh, well, comment on this. to be said, of course, but um, it's really interesting to see the end product. <laughs> you, you've suffered this for quite a while, haven't you, without knowing the end product? Um, so, of course, I, I feel really sort of involved and like, I have lots of nitpicky things to say, but I think there's just, <laughs> just two things I want to say, um, which are about the way in which translation can like, further or undercut the political principles of the whole project. Yeah. Um, the first thing is that I see very much what you were saying about the woman who was clearly sort of working class woman speaking the very normal way, not in a kind of high register or anything. But I think if when you focus too much on the translation, you sometimes don't give the viewer credit mm. for being able to see mm. see the woman, see uh, hear her tone of voice, yeah. um, perhaps hear that she's sort of you know talking very quickly and spontaneously without forming nice mm. sentences mm. and. And, and, and the view, you know, the viewer will yeah. draw their own conclusions of from course. that. I mean, they're not necessarily able to read, um, you know, social class in a person's yeah. dress and style well, the way the way you know those of us who are here can. But they, they can see pick up on certain cues. But they will read something else. They may read, uh, you know, what a lot of people do. They, they may think this woman is just um, uh, recycling without understanding uh, the, the kind of language that he hear, she hears in the media, like al qill al mundessa for instance, mm -hmm. you know, but she wasn't doing that, mm -hmm. and that's part of her character, she was not recycling mainstream cliches that come packaged, which a lot of people recycle without even understanding it, you know, I mean, that's normal, mm -hmm. but, but the reader, will, the viewer and the reader will always read something, whatever the choice you make, yes. yeah, they will always read something, because the language cannot be disconnected from, yeah. from the image. Yeah. The second thing was about the, um, the code switching, mm -hmm. and what I would say in that point is, although I you know, I, I don't remember having that specific problem, and I wasn't so involved in the words of women stuff. Um, is that the translator is obviously thinking? Perhaps they think, of, you know, should I translate this? Am I going to do something interesting yeah. here? Should I speak English? But they probably then think, well, that way the person's not going to the Spanish speaker is not going to understand it as well, and will that help my political project mm -hmm. if my Spanish viewer can't understand what this person is even saying? So. But they are, they are a viewer. There's a tension, right? They are a viewer as well if they don't know English, won't understand. Yeah. Sure, but if you have the option of the translator to be yeah. more comprehensible, yeah. then that's a bonus, right? Yeah, so yeah. 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 So this is but what, essentially, whatever choice you make has implications, and there are no perfect choices that kind of cover the whole ground. You're always sacrificing something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wondering, you know, the there's overlap. Yeah, with the filmmakers. Um, and I was wondering if some of the issues that arise have to do with the training, I mean, the fact that you know, compare them to global translators, and the fact mm. that they are very aware mm. of how political the entire process of mm. translation is, and that this perhaps, this same awareness is perhaps not mm. uh, necessarily there uh, among. Uh, Group, uh, mm. that you um, mm. were uh, sort of looking at. But also, I was wondering, yes, state of emergency, initially they were subtitling at great speed, etc. But Mussolini's repertoire is huge. huge yeah. And then people had time, actually, to go back to these videos. Mm. <laughs> I wish. And, and, some, and sometimes they did. did. Some, more, sometimes they did cut it. And actually reflect on what they had done initially, right? And you know, say, okay, this time I didn't sort mm. of uh, represent the mm. code switching or whatever. Mm. Uh, and maybe now, with more experience, with hindsight, that allowed maybe I can play more. Have you seen any of this kind of development uh, over time? Yeah, I, I know that. Uh, well, from my interviews, I know that some of the filmmakers told me that um, when they ha when they were going to show uh, clips in various places, because they go to Argentina, they go to Greece, they, I mean, the solidarity works um, in that way, uh, that they would they would then look at them for the first time, look at the subtitling seriously for the first time, and if they weren't happy with some of it, they would change it. 
So there, there is that. Or send it back to us. Or send it back to, yeah, and, and, uh, and, and change it. So some of that's happening. I don't know if it, I don't know if they can revise all this now because people are also extremely tired. They are absolute, there's a case of, you know, a state, state, this, the current stage is burnout. Um, uh, no, but I think you get, you will get an interesting map. Yeah. Of how subtitling has yeah. developed yeah. over time. Yeah. You know, without correcting anything, yeah. just to say, look, you know, this is what they started off doing. Yeah. And look how that changed. And yeah. there's this Masantu graffiti when, yeah. you know, people started painting on the walls. Right. It was all very sort of childish and innocent. Mm. And then it became mm. gradually very, very complex mm. and layered, mm. etc. Mm. But I, I'm just wondering if the mm. same kind of trajectory isn't there with the subtitling. Well, it's very, it, I think it's very difficult to trace, isn't it, Katia? I mean, there's no way of tracing actually whether a, a, a particular clip has been subtitled, uh, has been revised at different points, is there? Um, I'm probably the only one who would know. Who would know, yeah. 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 <laughs> it has been revised. I think, Yanni, yeah, how many of you subtitled, for example, over how much time? At the business period, maybe 15 people? How much time? Oh. Three, two years, I mean, what three would years? have to sort of map somebody's work like that yeah. mm -hmm. over a six months? Mm -hmm. Has that work changed? You know, it's amazing. This is this is really amazing. Me, but the, the, from all the interviews, nobody remembers what they subtitled, yeah. <laughs> and and even the filmmakers sometimes don't remember which film they made. You know, it's just, it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, it was that period, you know, very intense period, and people weren't focusing on themselves. It's not my work, it's not me. Yeah. It's kind of... Um, and, and it's also very collaborative. I mean, the, the, the bit I've seen from, you know, uh, you know, I would produce something and Katia would change it, and then somebody else would suggest something else, and it would change again before it goes up online. So I suppose it's partly that nobody, no individual takes ownership of it yeah. as it's such. It's very transient as well, right? It wasn't it's very the trans same, groups, same group of people. Yeah. That's right, that's right. And the other thing is that I think, possibly, that uh, all this volunteer subtitling was done through uh, people like um, the Mussolini lot and, and Katia and uh, Leil, for example, sending out messages on social media, calling vo for volunteer translators into particular la uh, languages, so that the, the, the community that you ended up with was not self-organized. It was just different people coming to do different things, whereas the, the groups that I studied mm -hmm. before, the global groups, they are self-organized. Nobody kind of put out a call for them. They thought, right, we're going to form a group uh, and we're going to do this because it's important and because it has a political dimension and everybody who then came into the group knew that these were the rules and that's what that's what they were doing. Um, the, the communities that translate from the Serene, they're kind of dispersed. They're not, and they're not I mean, they're self-organizing in the sense that, for, for example, Katya coordinates the list, but they're not self-organizing in the sense of saying, this is our project, mm -hmm. this is what we want to do, and this is how we want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, obviously, I'm, I'm extremely proud of my wife. Everybody's extremely <laughs> proud of my wife, but I have, I mean, you know, uh, I have real reason to be proud of my wife. I'm extremely proud of my friends, but, you know, the funny thing about the way they work I mean, Musirin and also the translators from Musirin is that, I mean, they are so, you know, they're so politically pure and committed and stuff like this, is that, I mean, the, the, in terms of making the videos, there's no author of any of the videos. Yeah. It's completely diffused, you know, there has to be, there has to be mm. agreement about what gets done. And same thing with the subtitling. I mean, you, nobody takes yeah, credit for the exactly. subtitling, etc. So it is actually, I mean, in terms of, org I mean, I think, I mean, yes, you've pointed to these cases. And, I can see them now, and now that you actually isolate the scenes or whatever, it's a bit funny. Yeah. But I mean, it, I mean, as you say, it's not just a question of doing it in crisis. I mean, it's not just a question of the, the, the circumstances of the translation, but it's, um, it's something about the way it was done, you know, contributed to this. And I, I mean, I think that the comparison with the social world, or the World Social Forum, for example, doesn't really hold in this case, because an, another element of what, of what went on between filmmakers and translators was I mean, there, I mean, you know, there was a certain element of this, I and mean, I wasn't directly involved. And the only reason there was no Persian translation is completely my fault because I've been very lazy. And I've been oh. <laughs> but um, I could solve gender. No, but you know, they. I mean, it, the, the subtitlers were very, very. Um, not only did they come in later, but they were also extremely hands off. I mean, they did not want to be seen exactly. to be intervening in. You know, it was Egyptians making the videos, and some of the subtitles were different, and some weren't. But it was this idea that. 
you know, these people are doing it. I mean, Samach was obviously yeah. there as well. But it was this attitude like, you know, it's a privilege for us just to be able to do the Musa in videos. Yeah. So we're never going to, we're never going to criticize or yeah. Yeah. input. Yeah. You know, it was kind of this idea yeah. of, there's a whole you know, profound respect yeah. for the work and then this, you know, this, And that's the whole solidarity thing, right? If you're going to be, a, you know, if you're going to be an international, somebody from abroad that you want to give solidarity, you're not going to tell people how to right. do things, you're just going to... But there are also Egyptians there. working there. Yeah. But I mean, this whole uh, issue of positioning, that's an, another big topic, which is also part of the project. And you see it in, uh, you know, the, all the subtitlers I interviewed and talked to, uh, they were very hands off, mm-hmm. uh, even to the point where I said, you know, you can see in some, in many places, actually, where the filmmaker has done the writing at the bottom to say who's speaking, for example. Now, and the subtitler only has that space at the bottom to put the subtitle. Couldn't you ask the filmmakers to just move that, put it somewhere else, because they can do that easily? No? Didn't think about it. Not my place, you know. Uh, so there's a lot to do with positioning and uh, the, the use of uh, pronouns, for instance. So even Samah, who is very politically al- alert, throughout her interviews, she refers to Musurin as they. They. And at the same time, there's no us. It's like us, the subtitles. It's they and then me individually. Yeah? Um, if you look at the mailing list, if I may refer to that, um, there's a lot of kind of very, um, the language that's used with the subtitles, even with Katya saying, you know, you lovely people, you've done a wonderful job, you know, uh, uh, you've done great stuff and so on. You only say that, you only thank people who are not part of your group. You do not, Omar doesn't thank Khalid, you know? <laughs> so there is that kind of really um, disconnection which, um, in another life, in another revolution, if we have hindsight and the time to reflect, maybe it could be different. But but this has to do also with all the, the things that people internalize about translation, including the people who do the translations. That it's something that is supportive, that it kind of comes after. That all that is, is playing out, of, of course. You know, It's not just a, because it's a political project. It's, it's something ingrained in people's minds. But I think that's quite right in many ways. Yes. I do think that's right. I what? That that's... Translation is supportive, it's not necessarily an integral part, it's not particularly in a situation where, you know, there's a revolution happening in Egypt and many of the volunteers and people who want to be able to take this message, mm-hmm. you know, back to their own country or people in mm-hmm. other countries who speak their language. And the idea that, you know, if, if tra- perhaps the translation became really central and these people had, you know, I think you should, you should say this and this would make it easier for us, and I can translate this better this way if you do this, that sort of brings in the idea of like, marketing it to those audiences, so it converge on that, you know? Not necessarily, because, I mean, the filmmakers don't have to agree, but that dialogue is necessary. I mean, it's, you know, the film is a composite, even at the level of creativity and of aesthetics, the film is a composite. You are adding an element to the film that's obviously affecting it at many different levels, aesthetically, politically, so, and, and these people volunteer their time, you know, it's not easy, it really is not easy to subtitle a, even a, even a five-minute clip. You, they, 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 they are giving to, 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 to the project, so why not? Uh, I mean, Salma Tarzi reflected on, on this in her talk, you know, as a filmmaker when she was alerted to it, she then started thinking, you know, my God, it's not even ethical of me to, I mean, I'm treating them as if they're kind of, you know, these subtitles don't exist for me. Uh, and it's not even ethical. We are part of a political culture that says everybody who's collaborating uh, is, is on an equal footing. So why aren't we applying this to subtitles as well? So there are lots of dimensions there that you could engage with. Yeah, but it needs it needs a space to converse and to talk about it and to and to reflect on it. Um, just a slightly different uh, question. Um, I, I wonder, as uh, as political events moved forward and there was more and more of this kind of film, if, if there was a certain kind of a corpus of translations and appropriate translations that emerges, and uh, this is the way you translate this idea, mm. is, there, is there some kind of convergence in kind of orthodox translation of various, various mm-hmm. kinds of things? I wish you'd come to the conference, actually, because this, this was a running theme that I didn't expect to come up, but people were talking about it even irrespective of translation, in terms of, because people are... Um, going through a very, very, very tough time at the moment. And they are reflecting on things that have gone on and what could, have, what could we have done differently. And, and, but they're also reflecting a lot on the language. And the problem is that language, you know, even if you fix it for five minutes, it gets co-opted mm-hmm. and it changes. And even the choices that could have been wonderful, you know, had everybody been really alert and on the ball, 
uh, at the time will mean something else now. Will you know the, the political landscape is constantly changing. Maybe that is an argument for resubtitling with a view to to the constantly changing political situation. So there is no. I mean, language and translation don't work like that. You you know everything changes all the time. Well, what makes me what makes me uh, think about it is uh, like Google Translate, which of course is yeah. based entirely on you know statistical uh, occurrences yeah. uh, in, in comparable cor corporate. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, you know, we, we all you know, laugh at it because it's humorous in many respects, but it's, uh, it's it's much better than any kind of automated translation mm -hmm. based on grammar or anything, mm -hmm. anything yeah. like that. So there, there it does seem to be typically kind of a convergence mm -hmm. of, uh, of translations around certain mm -hmm. kind of regularities, and I'm just wondering what the uh, what the ideological effect of that is. I uh, I have a I, I can't remember exactly where it was published, but I have it somewhere. A wonderful uh, article about Google Translate, which looks at the because it's supposed to be completely and utterly objective. It's after all, it's based and on algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. But the author, who obviously knows the technology, really takes it apart and shows that uh, precisely because it is based on this algorithm, what it does is it amplifies the already. Exactly. mainstream choices in language, the already dominant choices, and to the point of giving completely different take on things, because it, it, it it's based on the, you know, if, if you're already dominant and if you already have the spaces to publish and so on, your, your discourse is going to flood the place, exactly. and it's based on an algorithm. So, exactly. so um, you know, political principles and ideologies can't work by algorithms. In fact, it's, it's, it's usually against the mainstream that you're trying to, to, to work in. Yeah. They can't work that way, but they're nevertheless ruled by them in some respect. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And it's a constant kind of struggle decision to say, what choice do we make, you know, and what are the implications. I remember once giving a workshop, when we were in Qatar, actually, you were giving another workshop, and I was talking about the choices in a film, Janine Janine, the subtitling, where everybody was talking about shohada, 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 and the subtitling was really trying to avoid using martyrs at all, because you know it, it, it's loaded in the context of Islamic terrorism and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was explaining it, and Ahdaf Suwif happened to be there, and she said, we must stop doing this. They cannot, they cannot take their language, our language away from it. We use shohada, and we use it the way we want to use it, what it means to us. And of course, there is a point, and there is a point in time when you can do this. And so you can't just go with a with one or, or, or other, uh, uh, or you can't even say that one one choice is right and one is wrong because every choice has political. It's again the dialectic between universality and particularity. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's a constant struggle, and yeah. you have to be on the board always. Uh, but that's what it's about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.